welcome to the program. I'm Teniola Shaboale. Former Kenyan President Mwai Kibaki, who led the country from 2002 to 2013, has died at the age of 90. As leader, Kibaki, one of the country's richest men, ushered in economic reforms and a new constitution, but failed to deliver on promises to combat corruption. His tenure was also marred by the disputed 2007 polls that led to deadly violence. Waikibaki, Kenya's third president, who served from 2003 to 2013, was credited with reviving the country's ailing economy through fiscal prudence and infrastructure projects. But his legacy was tarnished by his disputed 2007 re-election. Opposition leader Rayla Odinga had been ahead by several hundred thousand votes when the election commission abruptly stopped announcing the results and ejected journalists. Hours later, the commission announced Kibaki had won by a narrow margin and was hurriedly sworn in. Why you Most observers say the elections were flawed. Adinga calls for protest, sparking a deadly police crackdown. 1,250 people died in the violence. Former UN chief Kofi Annan finally brokered a peace deal between Kibaki and Odinga, resulting in a grand coalition government with Odinga as prime minister. Kibaki, a former economics lecturer, served as finance minister under Kenya's first two presidents, Jomo Kenyatta and Daniel Arap Moy. Describing him as a quintessential patriot, President Uhuru Kenyatta has ordered a mourning period to honor Kibaki, during which flags will be flown at half-mast. As a university lecturer, a legislator, member of parliament for five decades, a cabinet minister, vice president, official leader of the opposition, and finally, as the third president of the Republic of Kenya, Emilio Mwai Kibaki was a quintessential patriot whose legacy of civic responsibility will continue to inspire generations of Kenyans long into our future. Kibaki was among Kenya's richest men, overseeing vast land holdings and business interests. When he handed over power to Kenyatta in 2013, Kibaki retreated to his home in one of Nairobi's plushest neighborhoods, close to his beloved Mataiga Golf Club. He survived by several children and grandchildren. The VOA's Mohamed Yusuf is in Nairobi, from where he joins us for more on this. Mohamed, what's the mood like in the country? How are Kenyans reacting to the death of former President Kibaki? Yeah, the mood is a bit somber in the capital, Nairobi, and most parts of the country. But uh, as a leader, of course, he is remembered for many things. Uh, of course, um, Kibaki came in in 2002 when Kenya was battling uh, an ailing economic. Uh, at the same time, there was no political freedom. And that's the time when Kibaki came into power and bringing an end to 40 years of one-party rule. And at, at that time, people were really running for change. They wanted freedom, free, uh, media freedom, and also political freedom. And he gave that uh, people that uh, when he came into power. And people remember him for economic reforms he undertook when he was he was in power. And of course, many people generally, of course, they speak about what happened in 2007 when there was a disputed election presidential vote and what followed next was much violence and many people getting killed and about 300,000 people displaced from their homes. But generally, um, of course, with now uh, uh, many people generally across Africa and many countries talking about the economic situations in the world, um, many Kenyans are able to raise and, and speak about the, econo the economic reforms that he undertook uh, to bring people, the, the, the people and the country up. Um, President Uhuru Kenyatta has ordered a mourning period uh, to honor Kibaki. What other plans are expected in terms of his uh, funeral arrangements? Will he be accorded a state funeral? Of course, he will be accorded a state burial, uh, burial of course, like uh, Ali last year, back in 2020, when the former president, uh, his predecessor, Kibaki predecessor, Dani Arab Moy, when he died. Of course, he will be given a state funeral, but uh, that arrangement, I think, the government is sort of waiting um, on the way forward from the family and they'll be giving uh, um, details uh, in the coming days. 
but of course he will be given that state funeral and and, of, and many people think that maybe hope that uh, during his battle, there will be there will be a holiday here. And but uh, for now, um, uh, uh, people are really really happy about his legacy. But at the same time, I'm sure many people won't, were not happy with what happened in 2007. But of course, we'll be accorded a state funeral. All right, then VOA's Mohammed Yusuf, thank you so much for joining us on the program. And in West Africa, Mali's military leaders have launched a 24-month transition plan that they say will lead to elections. The military seized power in August 2020 and has been under pressure to return the country to democratic rule. Regional body ECOWAS had last month asked the military leaders to limit the transition period to between 12 to 16 months before elections are held. Prime Minister Kugel Maiga cited the global economic outlook the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic embargo imposed on the country as reasons for the lengthy transitions. He told the National Council of the Transition, the legislative body, that the coming months will be used to establish a body to manage elections, develop election material, train electoral agents and review the electoral roll. Meanwhile, still in Mali, the French military says it has filmed Russian mercenaries burying bodies outside a military base. Corpses, it says, are being used as part of a campaign of lies against departing French troops. The images taken by a drone after the French had left the Gossi base in northern Mali show what appear to be white soldiers covering bodies with sand. A Twitter account, which the French military says was probably a fake, created by the Kremlin-linked Wagner Group has already posted images of corpses buried in sand and held the French responsible for their deaths. Russia has not commented on the French accusations. And away from Mali, East African heads of state have agreed to deploy a joint military force to Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo to deal with the armed groups operating in the region. At a summit in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, the regional leaders resolved that such a force should be mobilized with immediate effect. There are no details yet on the size of the proposed force. A statement from the summit says all armed groups operating in Eastern DRC should on conditionally participate in a political process to resolve their grievances. Dozens of rebel groups operate in the mineral-rich region, some of which originate from neighboring countries or associated with the Congo's neighbors. And Somali's foreign minister, Abdisaid Musa Ali, says he has survived an assassination attempt involving regional government forces in the northeastern state of Puntland. Mr. Ali says he had been on holiday in the town of Galkayo when a regional police commander ordered local security forces to attack him. He says the attack happened when his family was having iftar, the meal taken after sunset during Ramadan that was hosted by a local traditional elder. Puntland Deputy Leader Ahmed Karash has condemned the incident and promises an investigation. The World Food Programme's regional director for East Africa says that there is a real risk of famine due to the drought in the Horn of Africa. Michael Donford says that funding gap is forcing the programme to make very tough choices like taking from the hungry to feed the starving. The message that I really want to send this evening is that time is running out. Funding is required. We have the capacity to respond only if we have the levels of funding required. And uh, it's forcing us to make very tough choices already. We're effectively taking from the hungry to feed the starving. And uh, at this time, we cannot forget about Eastern Africa and the populations affected by this drought. The drought has already had three failed rainy seasons, and we are approaching the fourth. In fact, we are now halfway through it. Originally, the estimates of the number of people affected at the beginning of this year was between 13 and 14 million. We now estimate this has increased to 15 to 16 million. And if the rains fail, or if they are below average, then this number could increase to 20 million. So we have a very real risk of famine. This is 
It's happening at a time when the level of food insecurity across the region has increased dramatically. Um, we are now estimating that 81 million people across Eastern Africa and the Horn are food insecure. This is a 60% increase since June 2021. What's causing it? It's a combination of ongoing conflicts. And I've spoken to you previously about Tigray. It's the climate effect. It's the droughts and also the flooding. Um, we're also now seeing the macroeconomic impacts of COVID. Now we're seeing a spike in the cost. Some of this is related to Ukraine, as you know. Others are uh, due to other factors such as rising fuel prices. When I look particularly at the situation as it relates to the drought, the numbers are really very alarming. Um, in, in Ethiopia, there are 7 million people who have affected. In Somalia, we estimate, as I mentioned, between 5 and 6 million. And in Kenya, 3.5 million. In fact, we even now are getting reports of drought in Djibouti, uh, the government announced previously, and we're seeing uh, significant numbers, up to 55% of the rural population affected by this drought. Seven people linked to the brutal killing of Zimbabwean national Elvis Nyati in South Africa repaired at the Randburg Magistrates Court in Johannesburg. The accused men are charged with murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, robbery, assault with intent to cause grievous bodily harm and extortion. The 43-year-old gardener was brutally assaulted and burned to death after an anti-crime protest in a community where some members accused foreign citizens in this township of numerous crimes. Previously, uh, 14 people were brought to court, but as the NPA, we could only institute a prosecution against uh, seven out of the 14 due to insufficient evidence against the other seven. So, um, indeed, uh, as the prosecutor went through the contents of the docket, he found that there is a prima facie case against all seven before court. Uh, regarding the strength of the state case, that question will be answered by this court in due course when uh, all evidence has been presented and um, the court will then make a determination in relation to the strength of the state case. Uh, accused before court are facing uh, charges of a very serious nature and they are charged with offences that falls within the ambit of Schedule 6, so the onus is upon them to convince the court that there are exceptional circumstances that permit their release on bail. As the family, we are still uh, scared, uh, we are still traumatised, especially the wife and the brothers and even the guy, his friend that was there, uh, Prince Mkwebu, is still uh, not okay, even when you look at him, when you speak to him about it, he's still not okay. He's even uh, planning to go home as well because he feels and self the in deep salute. and even other family members they didn't even attend the court here not because they don't want to come but only because they are scared they think that uh, the families or uh, or the friends of the perpetrators the killers of my cousin will recognize them Rwandan President Paul Kagame says his country is not trading human beings in his first comments on Rwanda's deal with the UK on migrants. Under the deal, asylum seekers arriving in the UK on small boats will be relocated to Rwanda for processing and resettlement. Mr Kagame says it would be a mistake to think Rwanda was just getting money for migrants. He adds that he decided in 2018 when he chaired the African Union that Rwanda would offer shelter to migrants stuck in Libya while trying to cross to Europe. However, nearly a thousand migrants have since been taken to Rwanda for processing, with two-thirds of them being relocated to countries in Europe and Canada. And to our Africa Tech segment, tech giant Google says Nigeria's GDP is set to witness a massive boost to the tune of $10.1 billion and the creation of 1.6 million jobs by 2025. Director Google West Africa, Juliet Emoa, made this known at the landing point of the Equiano subsea cable in Lagos. And she says it will become a critical element in meeting Nigeria 
Nigeria's current and future international connectivity demands. Also speaking at the landing point, Lagos State Governor Babajide Songolu said this will firmly position Nigeria as the regional connectivity and content hub for West Africa. Thank you very much. It's a one-of-a-kind gathering of players in Nigeria's tech ecosystem. From government and private sector, the traditional institution amongst others, here to witness the virtual landing of the Ikuano subsea cable in Lagos, Nigeria. Very quickly, I'd like to specially recognize... Coming from Portugal and received in Nigeria by West Indian Ocean Cable Company, the cable is said to have brought good tidings to Nigeria's tech ecosystem and economy at large. Equiano's contribution to the digital economy means that by 2025, real GDP is forecast to be 10.1 billion U.S. dollars higher than it otherwise would have been without the cable. Increased internet penetration is also projected to boost job creation. Between 2020 and 2025, Equiano should indirectly create 1.6 million new jobs, equivalent to 330,000 per year over the assessment period. Lagos State Governor Babajide Somolu and Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Nia Debayo, welcomed the development. The Equino cable landing certainly, we believe, will change, will change completely the digital economy and the digital transformation of not only Lagos, but indeed Nigeria. We've heard that this will be 20 times bigger and, 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 and faster than the existing capabilities that we have in our country. We recognize that this is a significant contribution towards the growth of the Nigerian economy, and we remain, we remain committed to working with you to bring to life our vision of sustainable and inclusive growth of the economy. When live, Google says the subsea cable will increase internet speeds by a factor of six, reduce internet retail prices by 21%, increase internet penetration by six percentage points, boost GDP by $10.1 billion by 2025, and create 1.6 million jobs, and also save 2.8 million tons of CO2 emissions per annum. Victor Mathias, Channels Television News. And joining us to discuss the impact this development will have on the Nigerian economy, especially the tech ecosystem, is Julia Tehimua, Director, Google West Africa. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. So we've heard a bit the impact this will have on the Nigerian economy. So let's focus on the impact this will have on the internet experience of the average Nigerian and of course the country's tech ecosystem. Absolutely. So in the last 10 years, we've seen a year on year growth in Nigerians getting online and doing amazing things online. One of the challenges that have been reported time and, again, and time again is the high cost of data. And the fact that a bandwidth capacity is not always reliable and it's not readily available in every part of the country. One of the issues that we're addressing with this cable is providing that additional capacity and also helping to drive down prices. Our research and analysis shows that this cable has the potential to reduce retail prices to the consumer by 2025 by 21%. Also, it is projected that in the next five years, an additional 300 million new users will come online. This represents increased demand for internet connectivity. And so this additional capacity will serve to uh, satisfy that demand. And are there plans to extend the connectivity beyond Lagos? So the cable is landing in Lagos, and this cable is running from Port Harcourt all the way along the west coast of the region. So Port Harcourt, uh, Portugal, Togo, Nigeria, St. Helena, Namibia, and South Africa. 
And in Lagos, we're landing with a local partner, WIOC. The intention is to partner with different providers in the industry to be able to distribute this bandwidth and make it available for businesses and for end users. The cable has 20 times more capacity than previous uh, submarine cables. And so it offers a lot of bandwidth capacity. And the intention is for this to be, the intention is to have a, a, a partnership model to just really help distribute this bandwidth. And this is coming a month after Equiano made its first landing in Africa in Togo. Just explain to us the roadmap here. Yes, so the cable runs from Portugal through the west coast of Africa, and so it started from uh, Togo. Now we're landing in Lagos. The next stop will be St. Helena and then Namibia, and the final stop will be South Africa. And so it would be connecting Africa with Europe. And the intention is to support the region's digital transformation. We know that when we talk about growth in our overall economies, the growth of the digital economy will play a very important role in fueling that. Because if we take Nigeria as an example, whilst in the last few years, we've seen a reduction in investment in other sectors like the real sectors, investment in the digital space, in the technology space has actually increased. We've seen more foreign investment in this space. And so to just really help fuel the acceleration that we're seeing in this space and ensure that we have a thriving digital economy, businesses can expand their reach, people can broadcast themselves, enhance their skills, we can have more online learning and self-directed learning, and those kinds of opportunities. With us saying we've lost connection uh, with uh, Julia Tehimuhan, uh, who's the director of Google West Africa, but I do believe she made her point on the benefits of the Equiano subsea cable, and that's our Africa Tech segments today. <laughs> Well, let's head over to the Democratic Republic of Congo now, where Sister Siza spends most of her day manning the micro-hydroelectric plant she built to overcome daily electricity cuts in a town of Miti in the east of the country. Blackouts are a daily disruption in Congo, a vast Central African country of around 90 million people that sources most of its electricity from a rundown and mismanaged hydro power system. Clad in her white veil, tucked under a builder's hat, she spends most of her day manning a micro-hydroelectric plant she built to overcome daily electricity cuts in her town of Miti in Democratic Republic of Congo. The convent needed an electrician, a technician who could help. They saw in me the talent of electrical engineering, so they offered me an opportunity to go study electrical engineering. That's where it all started. It was the convent that made me study. I studied at ITFM, and when I finished, I started this service. Blackouts are a daily disruption across the country, which sources most of its electricity from a rundown and mismanaged hydropower system. Despite millions of dollars in donor funding, the World Bank estimates that only around 20% of the population has access to electricity. Fed up with relying on candlelight and costly fuel power generators, Caesar started raising money in 2015 to build the hydropower plant. With the current we produce for the school, we believe that we are training young people, and with the current that we give to the hospital, we feel that we serve the whole population, because we are there for the poor, and it is in the hospital that we meet people from poor backgrounds. 
Thanks to our efforts, students at Miti Secondary School can now learn computer skills from screens instead of books. This electricity is very important because it helps children a lot. It also helps the school. Before we had electricity, we had computers, but the computer courses were always theoretical and it was a lot of pain. So this has helped a lot. Without the plant, residents in Miti would only have electricity two or three days hours. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenyo Lashabuale. Have a lovely weekend.